Good evening, all. Welcome to week 15 of the Pacific Division Shelter and Capacity Building Series. You know how excited I am usually um, to see familiar faces, and I just love how everyone will just start typing their names already. We do have 25 weekly sessions total. This meeting will be recorded and sent out afterwards. Thank you so much, Tina Wan, for being me last week. I was on a DR. Thank you so much for being my position. You did a wonderful introduction and a facilitating. My name is Yi Wei. I joined a uh, Red Cross as a volunteer in 2009. I am the Mass Care Regional Program Lead in Los Angeles, and I'll be your facilitators throughout this whole series. If you can type your names in the chat, what you're already doing, in the regions you're from so we can say hi to each of you. I also encourage you to reach out to each other after the session just to get to know each other. And I had the privilege for to meeting Cynthia and Deborah in one of the training division trainings and just so lovely to see all of you. Um, I've muted your uh, mic and your camera for now just because we do have a large group and I'm going to unmute you later on when we get to the Q&A session. You can also type your questions in the chat. If you do have a Red Cross email address, you will be added to the distribution list. If you don't and you want to be added, let me know your email and I'll go ahead and add you. So the goal for our capacity building series is to build our workforce confidence. Uh, to provide practical tips for mask your operations and to provide all of us a very collaborative environment for all of us to communicate. Um, I think we're achieving that very well so far. We've had more than 1,500 1500 people attended our 14 sessions so far, and most of you guys attended all of your sessions, as you know. I'm extremely grateful for all the leaderships, for all the people, all the presenters, for everyone who attended our sessions. And my real hope is by having all the weekly sessions, you'll be more prepared when we have an operation. If there's anything that you want to see in the future, please type in the chat and we'll make sure to put that on the agenda. Today's topic is shelter resi resident transition, but before we get started, I'd like to read a letter we received from a client. So as I said last week, I was on a disaster relief operation uh, two weeks ago in Los Angeles region that we opened a shelter for a apartment complex fire. And we received a letter from a client and I'd like to read it to you so you can share and you can also hear what the clients are experiencing with us. The letter says, to whom it may concern, my neighbor's family and I are very grateful and pleased with the American Red Cross and its volunteers and the outstanding assistance, food, care, relief, and shelter. So many hard and dedicated volunteers that contributed are greatly appreciated. And just to name a few of so many caring individuals were Barbara Chapla, one of our caseworkers, Alonso Cephas, also a caseworker, Ned Giro, one of our AmeriCorps, Willem Keith, I think he's also on call, one of our shelter supervisors. Again, there are so many of his dedicated volunteers that were involved that I did not name them all, but all were equally as important. Friday evening, as I arrived home and saw the burned down apartment, I was somewhat, somewhat shocked and sad at the same time. And soon thereafter, I was told by one of the twin unit neighbors to go and sign up for help as there was a shelter nearby. My oldest son, Gabriel, and I went. As I stepped into the gymnasium, I was both happy and surprised and sad, mixed the feelings of everything that was going on. I got to meet the first Red Cross volunteer, Willem Keith. As I was signing up, I told Mr. Keith that I had graduated from this high school, but never imagined that I would be back at Garfield High School again in these conditions. We both laughed and joked around. The next morning, Saturday, I found myself meeting Barbara Chapla, one of our caseworkers, with, assist with the assistance of Alonzo Cephas, which also is one of our caseworkers. Barbara interviewed me and wrote down a lot of information, and I assisted in translating for the Spanish-speaking families. I asked Barbara how long the shelter would be open, and I remember her telling me, I don't know, we are here to open cases and to assist clients. Mr. Cephas constantly asked me if there were anything that they could help me with, so please ask them. And it was that time I could see that Red Cross volunteers are for real. People just like you and I. 
at the shelter, there was always plenty of food, water, juice, and even snacks for everyone. We never went to bed with our bellies hungry. As Sunday drew near, Mother's Day, I knew that if this fire hadn't had not taken place, we would be back home making a barbecue and having some neighbors come over to have a good time as usual, as our home was the center point for gathering and barbecue cookouts. I felt bad inside being Mother's Day and of the neighbors going through this disaster and having to live in the disaster and to live in the shelter. But things always happen for a reason, usually to learn from our mistakes. Thanks to Red Cross volunteer Louise, Mother's Day was saved. As I arrived Sunday night at the shelter with two little neighbors from the twin units that were not affected by the fire, we all got to eat pizza that the Red Cross provided. And then we went over to the arts and crafts table where Louise provided some beautiful arts. I chose the shapes and colors for some earrings for my wife. And Louise assembled them and I was even given an extra pair. The little two neighbors also had some custom made earrings for their mother. Louise placed the earrings in little bags so they would not be lost. Honorable that night, when my wife and I were alone, I told her, I did not get you anything for Mother's Day, but here you go. Those are the earrings. I chose these earrings for you, and she gave me a smile, which I can never forget. It filled my heart. I cannot read my wife's mind and heart, but I very much know that even though it was Mother's Day and having not made the barbecue get together, she was just happy that the whole family was together and was safe. Dad, mom, two sons, and daughter. Even it meant being in a shelter. Since I had never received assistance from the Red Cross before, I failed to realize something very important and probably to most people as well, that most of the people that work for the Red Cross do not get paid. They work out of their willingness, kindness, and warmth from their heart. As I close this letter, I find myself in tears. Funny, when I was a kid, I was the biggest crybaby in East Los Angeles. But now as a grown man, I know why I cry. And that is because nothing in this world has more value than the love and bond that people can make in life's experiences, especially extreme situations, like the one that I personally went through in this shelter provided by Red Cross during this fire emergency. I hope in the near future to give something back to the Red Cross by also dedicating some of my time as a volunteer. Sincerely, the Martinez family. I'm sharing this with you all to, to share that it's, I mean, when I read the letter, my heart was full. And I think sometimes, especially for us, if you know we move into the headquarters position, we do not get the client contact. We might not visit the client. For this one, our whole mask here leadership, along with our CEO, we brought Mother's Day's gift and flowers and cakes and food to present to them, to give it to them, along with our city councils and uh, supervisor's office. Sometimes it's just this little touch. It reminds us that why we do what we do, it gives us the humble feeling of we are really there for, their, for the clients the most difficult times. Sometimes we don't realize how much impact we're giving on us, on everyone else. And sometimes it's just a gentle reminder that maybe as a masculine lead, maybe as assistant director of operations, or maybe as a job director, maybe go out in the field and to have to have this realistic contact with our clients and to see how appreciative they are and how much impact we're making for our clients. And I hope. This, this letter also touched your heart as well. And I will yield the floor to Cynthia and John Hawley. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that, Iwe. That What a beautiful letter. Um, Cynthia, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I am going to jump off camera here, or on camera, I guess, just to say hi. Um, I have traveled down to LA today, so my noise in the background is a little bit higher than I had hoped for at this hour, but 
I am Cynthia Fisher. I am um, with the Central California region. I am the Mass Care Territorial Lead in that region and I have been with the Red Cross since, uh, um, well, 12 years now. So, um, my joy is SRT. I discovered it a couple of years ago and I'm proud to be here tonight to bring that to you and to the shelter teams that are here tonight. Thank you for everything that you do out in the field. That letter is just a small picture and a reminder how important you are. Agreed. That letter was very moving. Um, I was actually part of that that operation right after the DRMS course, and that was a you know it's a very very interesting time, very moving time. Thank you for sharing that, Eway. Um, my name is John Holly. I joined the Red Cross uh, roughly two years ago when the pandemic started um, here in Los Angeles and uh, mostly been in sheltering uh, for the last two years. And, uh, you know, my first experience with SRT was really uh, in this DRO in Kentucky uh, that we had starting in December. And it was a huge eye opener for me of how complex it really was um, and how fascinating it really is and how helpful and important it is. And I think um, this is one of the reasons why I'm here with Cynthia is because I really appreciate what, what the SRT team does um, and what it, what how it functions and, you know, getting people home. Um, let me go to this next slide. Oh, yeah. So, um, as you know, we have raise your hand if you have any questions. Turn off. Uh, right now, you shouldn't be able to have your camera on or your mic. Okay. Um, what I need to know about SRT shelter resident transition. SRT is a part of client first sheltering. Emphasis is on individual needs of each each client, supports the individual as well as the affected community. Client's recovery is supported by all Red Cross workers, a component within the Red Cross Mass Care and the Mission Adaption programs. Goals of SRT, Shelter Resident Transition, is an in-shelter service to help a client plan for transition out of a shelter to begin the next step in their recovery a client care program working inside the mass care sheltering program that empowers shelter residents, the Red Cross and its partners by identifying factors that may prohibit a shelter resident from transitioning out of a shelter. Through the capture and reporting on barriers and unmet needs of overall shelter population, SRT is able to identify and provide services and resources to address client needs. The Red Cross or D DCS mission adaption the Red Cross will ensure vulnerable people and communities can better cope with the potentially catastrophic results of climate displacement by adapting our mission, augmenting our, our own capacity and services, and building capacity in the most disaster-prone communities to prevent people from being, displace, uh, being displaced, shorten the time people are displaced, improve conditions people face when displaced, and reduce the risk of poverty caused by being displaced. And a fun fact, two of 18 geographies identified by national are in the Pacific Division, Butte and Lake Counties. Impacts of SRT within mission adaption. SRT empowers households to transition from a shelter to sustainable living solutions that shorten and improve conditions of displacement following a disaster, stabilize adverse effects of poverty on their, on their recovery, and build resiliency to cope against future loss. Uh, roles and responsibility. Cynthia, would you like to take over? Sure. So we are introducing to you tonight the roles and responsibilities as they will look for calendar year 2022. The shelter resident transition caseworker, a supervisor and manager. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> resident transition caseworker can be in person or virtually assigned to work with the shelter residents and assist them. SRT caseworkers will report to an SRT supervisor and have a casework specialty track in SRT. The SRT supervisors report to SRT site managers with the SRT specialty track of manager, so SRT manager specialty track. The SRT site manager will have the overseeing responsibility at the site of the multi-agency shelter resident transition team. Um, so that's gonna be the FEMA and uh, SBA or um, state 
offices that might be there. Anybody in that mast is what we call it. And they will have the responsibility of reporting directly to the DRO HQ SRT manager. At the headquarters, the DRO HQ SRT manager will coordinate with all of the leadership across all service lines. So this will be external relations, GovOps, all of those um, other service lines that do so much to support what comes next. They will directly be working with the sheltering manager and reporting to the mass care chief. So what does this look like? So at the headquarters, you have the AD of operations. And below them, there would be the Deputy Assistant of Recovery and Director of Response. So could be a DAD, there could be IDADs. Um, in this case, we're just using the simple process. And underneath the Assistant Director of Response is the Mass Care Chief. And under that Mass Care Chief is where you find your DRO HQ sheltering manager, right? And so underneath him or her, sorry, they, the shelter site manager would exist. And then at the shelter, there would be a shelter dormitory supervisor with service associates. And there would be a shelter registration supervisor with shelters um, associates there. So what is new for calendar year 2022 is we are now posed to work alongside the sheltering manager at HQ and they will be working closely together to report to the mass care chief. So how does this look as we go down? So at each shelter site, there will be a SRT site manager. Also, both of these will have the manager uh, specialty track. At the site, there will be an SRT supervisor. There may be multiple SRT supervisors that are there that will be responding to the SRT site manager. But under the SRT supervisors, there will be caseworkers. And those caseworkers will be the ones working directly with the clients. The supervisor will be help guiding them and the site manager be managing the MAST, the multi-agency shelter transition team, um, and reporting everything back up to the DROHQ. So at headquarters and in the field, SRT collaborates with shelter resident transition site manager, the multi-agency shelter transition team, community engagement and partnerships, elected official liaisons, GovOps, housing liaisons, SRT supervisors, shelter, other shelter resident transition caseworkers, the shelter site manager, the shelter workers, Disaster Health Services, Disaster Mental Health, Disaster Spiritual Care, Disability Integration, and not, um, not to forget recovery caseworkers. And there may be others that I've left off of this list, but this is a good picture of what that looks like. So once we've worked together in the shelter and at headquarters with the other service lines to bring services to the clients, um, SRT is busy collecting information and, and it's used by the DRO directors to get a picture and a snapshot of what the needs are for those clients. So those clients can work on their road to recovery. So all DRO directors and leadership will use it. Now that conversation goes further and it goes into the offices of emergency services. And we have the disaster operations coordinator center coordination center that is also taking in information that we're providing from the um, the, the shelter sites. Mass care leadership also will be looking at that information. And it could be something that we are pulling data about how many people are at a shelter that we have recorded. It could be about special needs that are at that shelter. Um, we also connect with external relations to get resources for um, immediate needs that might be able to be met through partner organizations or through state or federal government relationships. So external relations plays a really important part as we collect that information at SRT, we are able to push that information back up through a general reporting structure. Um, other 
caseworkers will use the information as well as the leadership. And we are um, also at that MAST or that multi-agency shelter transition team, which is composed of government and community organizations. And we're working together to find solutions to, to the biggest barriers and the smallest needs that each client has. So John, back to you for who qualifies for SRT, unless you'd like me to keep going. Uh, I can take over. Cynthia, before we go to the next slides, um, we have two questions in the chat. Um, number one is, so does that mean now shelter resident transition team, the reporting chain does not go through shelter manager anymore? That is correct. This is just coming down. Um, it is new for calendar year 2022, and it should be re um, reporting soon um, through D. Um, CS that should be coming in in on ops 4.0. We'll start seeing the release of this information. Um, the the slideshow was just finished late last week as final uh, approvals came in from national headquarters to release. You guys are the first hearing about it. This is a new uh, presentation on the information and it will be started to be trained and released and training coming out this spring. Got it. So that means that nothing has been posted on Exchange, right? It is still in the, I mean, in everyone's own laptop, has nothing been posted um, on Exchange. Yeah, don't go looking for it. This is the first release of the information that's going out other than um, high, high level conversations. And they gave me the go ahead to make sure that y'all got to see this today. Got it. Thank you so much. Jana, go ahead. Interesting. OK, so who qualifies for SRT? SRT clients. Um, client is a current resident in a Red Cross managed or approved partner shelter. Client has an unmet need as a result of the impact of the disaster. Uh, how do recovery casework and SRT casework differ? In recovery, we have, uh, let's see, has a RC or recovery care gap, provide recovery services at, at a mark, uh, service center, etc. Work with families not staying at a shelter. Primarily provide immediate assistance and recovery immediate assistance dependent upon damage assessment. For shelter resident transition has the uh, has a SRT specialty track. Provide SRT services within a shelter. Work with shelter clients. Primarily provide referrals, advocacy, and SRT financial assistance. And SRT financial assistant is not dependent on damage assessment. Uh, for shelter resident transition process, uh, upon arrival, client arrives at a shelter. Um, action, C missed. And then next action would be shelter resident transition intake and triage. Next action is cl a client SRT casework. And anytime we can do client transition from the shelter and post shelter transition follow up. Locations of where SRT happens uh, can right, be. Now, yes. Before we move forward, we use several acronyms. So, what is CMIST? That is a great question that I would like to ask Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the document. It's a one page, um, I think it's a front and back, that Disaster Health Services, DHS, uh, sit down and do a cot to cot or a CMIST form and take in general health. Um, urgencies, conditions of the client, and they document it on a form. That form is then attached to the shelter registration sheet and will be kept together in calendar year 2022. As we look, move forward, the, that information will be held in private with the shelter registration form in the shelter manager's log. I see, I see two other questions, um, if I can go ahead and just say it or ask them to Cynthia. Um, Dave, Dave Crocker says, with significant numbers of clients occupying an outside, outside shelter in their vehicle or even in a tent, do they count as a resident? So each shelter location may have different components going on at that site. So there may be an interior shelter going on while RVs are parked outside or tents on the on the baseball field. So the idea is if it is a Red Cross run shelter and it is um, acknowledged and served as a shelter by the D 
disaster relief operation leadership, SRT will be included, shelter resident transition will be included as a service to those clients. Um, a lot of times in California, the outside population is not early recognized as a shelter client, um, but they do get some shelter services like feeding and maybe DMH, disaster mental health. I see a really good question from Francisca. Um, how do SRT caseworkers and recovery caseworkers interact, if at all? For instance, what if a client seeks services at a FAC after they have left the shelter? Yeah, great question. And that's kind of why we brought this slide into the presentation tonight. Just to show you, um, the recovery workers are working with outside shelter populations, and the shelter resident transition caseworkers are working with inside shelter populations. If a shelter re resident shows up at a mark or a service center, um, they will likely just get redirected back to the shelter resident transition caseworkers at their site, but won't get turned away from um, trying from people trying to help them. But our goal is to serve the community at the recovery centers and serve the shelter residents at the shelter site. And, and Cynthia, could you explain what the acronym FAC is? Oh, Family Assistance Center from Francisca. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, so locations of where SRT happens. Uh, I think we kind of, kind of covered a little bit of this. Uh, it'll be at Mass, Shelter, Lobby of Hotels, IRV, SRT team, virtual. Um, you know, it can be in a number of places. I've, I've seen it done in a number of places, but usually as long as it's safe. Uh, so next slide, Red Cross services include DHS, DMH, DSC, reunification, service to the armed forces, disability integration, and others. Government and community organizations and services may be the primary resolution for a shelter resident to successfully transition out of the shelter. Advocate for the client's best interest to ensure accessing the full range of community and government resources. Shelter, resi shelter resi resident transition plans is led by the client, supported by the shelter resident transition ca caseworker, created over numerous interactions and flexible to accommodate changes, develop e equitability or e equitably for clients in a shelter, develop equitably for clients in a shelter, viability of plans confirmed by shelter resident transition caseworkers, focused on safe, sanitary, and sustainable housing solutions and supportive of individual family, individual and family overall recovery, including physical, psychological, and spiritual well-being. SRT empowers households to, to transition from a shelter to sustainable living solutions that resiliency, build resiliency to cope against future loss, shorten and improve, conditions of displacement following a disaster, and stabilize adverse effects of poverty on their recovery. Who deploys to work SRT? Okay, so for base gaps, um, we have recovery care SA, IDC DHS SAs, IDC DMH SAs, uh, IDC DSC SA and, and higher, um, and that responders. Actually, that responders helped us quite a bit uh, during intakes for SRT. Let's see, additional training, Shelter Fundamentals version two. And RC care roles that are that are part of SRT would be caseworker, IDC worker, caseworker supervisor intake, and ID address reviewer. Uh, the question is, what is IDC? I've heard what the acronym is. Uh, Cynthia? Yes, IDC is the Individual Disaster Care Group, which is your um, health services. So DHS is Disaster Health Services, DMH is Disaster Mental Health, and then uh, DSC is Disaster Spiritual Care. And those are the gaps that are posted for IDC. And they run the same, um, you can have a service associate, a supervisor and manager or chief in each of these gap regions. So hope that helps. Great, I see a few more questions. I'm gonna hold it to the end, if you guys don't mind. Uh, okay, so next slide. So want to become an SRT caseworker, 
review the shelter resident transition casework specialty track qualifications in the specialty tracks document. Um, I think I can probably paste this later. Uh, once completed, work with your disaster workforce engagement team to request the SRT caseworker specialty track to be added to your volunteer connection profile by requesting it via, via SRT at redcross.org. And here are a list of resources. Um, you can get the Shelter res Resident Transition Toolkit, uh, tr SRT financial assistance, and so forth. Um, we'll, we can post these later so you can have the links. And yeah, now we have finally have questions. Um, so I, the next question that I saw was from Dave. Sorry to ask this, but it might be worth once again explaining the difference between SRT and regular O client casework. Great question, Dave. Thanks for pushing on that um, so that there's clarity. So yes, I would like to just explain that recovery workers, caseworkers are in the community. They are at the resource centers that FEMA usually stands up. They might stand up their own um, little meeting spot at a church, but they're embedded in the community, helping the community recover. They deliver immediate assistance to clients that have destroyed or major damage to their homes and help beginning the process of referrals from community organizations. Those same referrals may be the, comp the organizations that shelter resident transition team is working with in the shelter. So there is some crossover and some coordination that goes on um, at a higher level that feeds itself back down through our external relations to build those relationships, GovOps to build those relationships. And the shelter resident transition team um, digs in and does deep casework. And uh, the idea is to help the client find the resources so that they can build their recovery plan to move out of the shelter. So everything that the shelter resident transition or SRT is doing with the clients in the shelter is to help them build a path and support them building their path for recovery after the disaster. Great. And we have two similar questions from William and Kathleen. Um, since this is new for fiscal year 2022, uh, what edge courses will be updated? And the other question was, will current caseworkers and SRT peeps have additional training for the new fiscal year 22? Yes, the, the SRT fundamentals is being updated at this time to release new training for SRT workers. The intention is to build better training programs for the supervisor and the manager levels with the work that they will do that is specific to their specialty track. So in that things are getting updated, but it is not updated right now. And what is getting updated? I can't tell you specifically because that is way above my volunteer pay grade. What was the other question? Uh, so the, I think those were the last questions. Um, you know, Michael made a funny comment. Uh, DAT responders are the Swiss Army knives of DCS. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think that are, are there any other questions for SRT? It's a very deep subject. I know it can be. <laughs> so everyone now has the capacity of unmute your mic. If you have any questions, you can just simply raise your hand. It will call on you and you can ask your questions. The slide that's showing right now is a slide that um, represents the regions within the Pacific Division and who have been identified as SRT trainers. Um, so that these connections in your region will be able to help guide new training or familiarity uh, and we'll all work together to build that for you. OK, so we have a question from Alex. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, do either of you have any mission moments from the field? Anything? Um, uh, horror stories that will uh, in, be intriguing enough that, oh, we've got to sign up for SRT. That's a really good question. I'm sure I have stories, but I cannot think of them right now. <laughs> Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia, I'm a little yeah. too nervous to think about that. <laughs> well, oh, the, sorry. The reason I'm doing this is because John was one of those very, um, 
one of those great reasons why we encourage everybody to look into SRT is because your heart is there, um, you're giving, you're talking, and you're helping, and, and in such a deep, deeper way than we could ever get just with a, a focus on feeding or just a focus on sheltering or just a focus on um, IDC, it really lets you deep dive and handhold a client and, and work with them. So Hurricane Laura in Louisiana was my first mission moment. And what I heard from the clients was thank you, that we blessed them by being there to help them. And because I was there, I was, I was providing that blessing that the Red Cross had given everybody to that client that was receiving it as a blessing. And that meant more to me than any other moment I've had in Red Cross is to know that I was able to stand there representing all of the hard work that everybody has done collectively in the individual responses and put it together where this person just was overwhelmed with gratitude. And so I pushed that back to you. And I think, you know, my experience with, with SRT, uh, when I was coming into Kentucky as mass care, uh, as, as, as a sheltering supervisor, um, immediately I was told right away when we got there that the, they were shutting down the shelters and we're moving to non congregate and that uh, we would have to be reassigned. And that's when I met Cynthia for the first time and she ex you know, explained the SRT need and it was great. So after three days of working the emergency aid stations is when I switched over to the SRT and it was... Uh, an amazing experience. I did not realize how complex it was and how how detailed it was. Um, it was very a very fascinating experience, um, especially working with IDC and the different functions and you know having having the groups itinerate together. It was a very collaborative process that was a, a huge eye opener for me, and I think it changed my mentality for, of the Red Cross that it's really all about the entire team and all of the functions working together cooperatively. And I used to think that you know, once the shelters closed, that was kind of the end of the heavy lift of a DR. And I was, you know, of course, I'm obviously completely wrong, um, realizing that the I feel like the heavy lift is now with, you know, in recovery and SRT. It really has been an amazing experience. Okay, before we jump on to Kevin, um, so Cynthia, uh, the list uh, does not include Idaho, Idaho and Montana. Whom do they reach out to if they want to get training? Um, great. So this list came down from National. I will point out to National that Montana and Idaho have been neglected and we'll try to find who the SRT trainer is there and uh, get them on the list for you. Thank you, Kevin. You're next. Well, thank you, Yue. Um, I just wanted to emphasize a little bit what John said about sheltering. And, and sheltering in SRT is they really have to work together. I think some of the questions talked about that earlier. It's like sheltering can't, SRT can't really do its work without the shelter workers. And I can't overemphasize that. So maybe we report to little different people, but we're the same team. It's like the CMS report, the registration form. Uh, those are super important to the SRT worker. Um, because some of you know that in order for us to give SRT funds, you have to be in a shelter for three days. That's verified by checking your registration form that you filled out um, and all the other information we have. And if you have a second, I can I can tell you, I think Alex asked for a story. I could tell a story that that about Cynthia that maybe um, talks about what SRT does. Um, one of the fires up north we were working at, I was working with uh, Cynthia. There was a, a woman in a, in a shelter um, that needed to to leave to go back, wanted to leave the shelter to go back home. Um, the area she was in, the um, uh, evacuations were listed, lifted, and she could go back, but she could get, not go back because of health reasons. Um, she had, um, I'm not sure what the condition was, but she couldn't go back because of the smoke. So health, Cynthia worked with um, DMH Health Services and they ended up getting um, some um, SRT funds for her for, uh, I believe, some some cleaning equipment. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but then they also needed to get her. She needed an additional three days after the um, shelter closed in order to be able to go back to have the air clear out for her. Um, so Shel um, Cynthia worked with 
the team and got an RDO exception to get an additional amount of money to pay for this um, woman to stay in a hotel for a few days until the uh, smoke cleared out and she could go home. Um, and it involved working with DMH, it involved working with shelter people, um, and then it worked worked within the system to go up the chain to our, get an RDO exception approved. So uh, I don't know if that's the kind of story you're talking about, Alex, but I like that story. And I think it tells a lot about Cynthia and, and the team. So, Thanks, thank Kevin. You. Thank, thank you for sharing that. We do have some questions. So um, number one, it's, is there any exceptions to the three days in the shelter? And if they get the um, SRT assistant, is it going to impact their recovery assistance for immediate assistance? Good question. Um, so anytime is the right time for SRT services, which means immediately we can, we can work with clients from the moment they walk into the shelter if it's on the path towards their recovery. If it can help them move on, we can work with them. Now, not everybody whose house burns down can say two days later, I'm ready to leave and I, I need some help and referrals to get on the road. But for those that maybe all they need is a, a bus ticket to Nevada to go live with family, um, we can get on that right away. Um, also, it, there's no qualifying factor, again, for SRT services other than you are in a shelter. That is the qualifying factor. And the biggest thing we do is referrals. Um, I, I really want to make sure that SRT financial assistance is there, but it is not guaranteed. It is not a lump sum. It, it doesn't have a specific dollar amount that everybody gets. It is on a case by case needs basis. And not everybody will get it. Some people can get out of the shelter without any financial assistance with SRT. Some people will never be able to make the move without SRT. So it is really a, a case by case basis. And um, what was the second part of your question there? The second part is, is it going to impact the immediate assistance from recovery? OK, great. Thanks. And no, it doesn't. Uh, simply, they're just different offers that the Red Cross gives. Recovery does immediate assistance and if they go into bridge or long term recovery, there will likely be assistance that is provided through that. None of it is a bookmark of how much money every case is different um, situation. So um, SRT is just exclusively for sheltering and it does not have a dollar amount that's set to it for each person to receive. It does not affect anybody else. Thank you. Got it. And you mentioned the bridge assistance. Could you talk briefly about the bridge assistance? Um, only to the point that bridge assistance works with uh, under recovery. Um, it's not associated to shelter resident transition. Um, immediate assistance is also under recovery. It is not. Um, it is not set up for shelter resident transition to necessarily navigate that. We do assist the clients in receiving their funds if they are eligible at the shelter. We help process that payment to them if recovery has made it available for them. Thank you. So another question from Michael is that back in uh, the beginning of 2021, they had a 72 hour vacate rule once they received the SRT funds. Is that still accurate? Each individual client, it, the, the question is a great question because it, it's often heard, why did we give them um, money for, for a tire and they're still in the shelter? Um, that tire may have been necessary to get them to the shelter or for them to get to a doctor's appointment while they're in the shelter. And we may have assisted with that, but um, on a case by case basis, I'm going to mute for just a second. Sorry.
So while same theory is muted, I just posted the um, comparison um, from SRT and recovery. If you click the link and sign with your volunteer connection uh, password, you're able to see that. Mercedes asked. Okay. If, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Cynthia. No, go ahead, John. I just thought, noticed another question, but go ahead and finish your topic, please. Okay. Um. So. Giving the client funds could be incremental or it could be triggering them to need to leave. And it could be that we say we're giving you these funds and you have to leave now, or we're giving you these funds and you have to leave within 72 hours. So the approval process that's coming from the management of SRT coming down to you as a caseworker, when those funds are committed to a client, um, that is who's going to say what the movement of that client is responsible for in relation to receiving those funds. So from a shelter worker standpoint, all you should know is that it could and you should communicate with the shelter resident caseworker for that client to have specific information about that client's process if you need it. And there's another question for Mercedes Prado. I believe I know this answer, uh, but but both casework and SRT cases share the same RC care system. I believe that's true. Is that is that correct? Yeah, so RC care is part of client care program. And yes, uh, recovery caseworkers are going to see the same case that SRT worker will see or a disaster health services um, person would see. It's all one client case, and, and that's how that sh that organically stays where everybody can see that other people are working with a client. I uh, don't know if what this was covered. Uh, just so Chun Chan says, just to clarify, SRT financial assistance is applied to level four and above. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for that question. Um, so traditionally, previous to this calendar year, um, that has been the, the trigger point, um, level four and above. What we're going to see SRT start to transition based upon certain triggers that a disaster relief operation has. Those will be in the very high end leadership um, documents, the initial planning tool and the um, service delivery plan will trigger SRT to come into a DR. And so, I guess I would ask that we just remove from our language skills that the SRT is only a level four response team um, because I think we'll see it grow in a different capacity in the future. Mm, interesting. Um, this is a question from Susie. Uh, so when folks leave the shelter and have SRT then leave, can they receive a DAT group and get further funds from DAT and then get a caseworker? Great question, Susie. Um, when folks leave the shelter and they have SRT, their case is there. Um, they will not get a DAT call. Um, DAT in the shelter is kind of the immediate assistance program that's out there. So if they lost their home um, and the trigger is there for immediate assistance um, and it's given on that DR, then that will be under the recovery team. So it will move straight to recovery and not a DAT. And here's an interesting question from Scott Fairfield. Uh, since RC care intake casework usually done shortly before they leave shelter, so SRT can assist anytime after clients arrive at shelter? Yeah, we should. Good question, Scott. We should start seeing SRT arrival earlier on disasters. So um, it could be you see them three to five days after a disaster has started in the right um, DR where that information is available and the triggers are met. Great. Is are there any other questions? I do. So Cynthia, could you describe a typical day? So how does you know? So I've heard that SRT that you're able to rotate to different shelters, etc. Can you describe your typical days like? <laughs> can I ask what a typical sheltering day looks like? And can you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, but I cannot. Um, That's why I put you on the spot. 
<laughs> you know, I think uh, Semper Gumby um, is the definition of all of the work that we do at the Red Cross. But for the most part, the shelter t team stands up. Um, the SRT team will come in to the shelter. They will connect with the sheltering manager and documents will be updated and exchanged for what's going on. The SRT team will set stations, hopefully, or decide to work mobily from cot to cot and um, work with clients to get their information established in the system and start working on their um, transition plans. Um, so every day, um, a shelter caseworker, SRT caseworker, should have um, anywhere between eight and 12 clients. And you may typically meet for an hour. So you may meet you know, five to eight clients a day um, for an hour. And then they're really deep dives and, and they're really working to get the client through the shelter as, as warmly and comfortably as possible while still encouraging them to, to, towards their recovery. Thank you, Cynthia. Any other questions from the group? And I'm not sure if we covered this topic earlier. I think William Keith asked, how do we get the information as a shelter manager, shelter supervisor? How do you get the information from SRT? Awesome. So great question. We have these wonderful things in RC Care. Um, they're called dashboards, and it pulls the information as the SRT caseworker is inputting the full casework into the system. It's generating a report, and that report is going to tell you know what shelter has what, how many residents, what um, their needs are, if they have transportation, if they have medical issues. The whole gamut will be reported on a dashboard, and that dashboard will be monitored by the shelter manager by the HQ managers, by DRO leadership. Um, it will be a transitional from RC Care into Power BI, which you would see on the national deployment um, information boards that the DR is looking at on weather and all of that. That should be part of the reporting in the future. So great question, but definitely a higher level of reporting that's there. But anybody needs specific information from a report, at any time, we can typically generate that. Yeah. Thank you. And Kathleen has a question is when should we expect this new rule for training and documentation since fiscal year 23 is only 1.5 months away? So thank you for that question, Kathleen. And uh, like I said, the new training is out for SRT fundamentals. Um, that is starting to get signups and scheduled with the SRT at redcross.org. Um, you can email them if you have specific questions or would like specific training. Um, they would be more than happy to help get a training for your area put on schedule. 